Yo, welcome back everybody to a brand new video here on the second channel. And today we're going to look at the online tournament results post EUIC this past week. Of course, with Orlando this weekend, it's pretty important to see what people are playing in the online tournaments post EUIC, what decks are being played, what lists are being played and all that stuff. I think it's very valuable to look at the results here to see what is going on in the online tournament space after a massive international like EUIC, which essentially set the standard for, you know, kind of what decks are good, where the meta is headed right now, leading in to Orlando. I'm not saying this is going to give us like a perfect idea of what's going to be played in Orlando, but we can kind of see how the meta is, you know, evolving or adapting and how are people, you know, what are, what's the reaction to the results at EYC. And I think the online tournament scene is a great way to kind of show some of that off before we head into this massive regional this weekend with Orlando, which I will be at attendance at and I hopefully will see some of y'all there. And if you're new here to the second channel, make sure to subscribe down below. We're on the road to 13K subs. And if you want to enjoy the video, leave a like. If you want to play in any of these online tournaments, I'll leave a link to play.limitless down below. So starting things off here, we got the redacted tournament now. Uh, this tournament here was, I'm pretty sure, the first tournament um, post EYC. That happened. It was a uh, all these tournaments are like large, hundred plus players. So the deck that won this tournament, of course, was Lost Box. We do see it as the Lost Zone version with the Moon and the Raikou, the Hands and the Hoopa. Uh, we don't see any Mew EX in the deck, which I like the Mew. You know, Pedro's build with the Mew, I think, is pretty solid against Charizard. I feel like the problem with Lost Box against Charizard is you have a great way to take out their Pidgeot with Raikou or Hands. You have the Moon. You can get through at least one Charizard. Then piecing together that like last knockout can get very difficult without something like a Mew or even like a double moon or something. Because essentially, once they Iona you into a small hand, you're probably not going to be able to chain together a KO in time. And it's going to be grim. Especially now that Zard's playing the Bibril in the deck, it's even harder. Because you can take out the Pidgeot, but they have a Bibril in play and they're still drawing cards. So it can get a little awkward. But it did win the tournament. It actually managed to take down Arc. Tina. Now, it's a very interesting Arc Tina 60 here playing that Relicanth. So, the idea behind Relicanth is it lets you either use Arceus V's first attack if you somehow don't get an energy. I feel like that's not going to happen because I, I guess if you whiff energy turn one, you can Starburst for DT plus Relicanth. Um, and then also you have the ability to use Relicanth to copy Shred. So, you can push Giratina into the active spot without needing to use Lost Impact. And, you know, sometimes you can lose a game because you have the Lost Impact to waste so much energy. You run out of ways to attack or your deck gets really low on energy and then all of a sudden you whiff an energy and then you're probably going to lose the game. Um, so, the Relicanth helps in that. It's also good against control, but it lets you Shred against control with Tina with the V-Star in play. And then you can, like, threaten Lost Impacts. It's an interesting 60. Um, there's no Judge in the deck, actually. It's playing an Arvin and um, two a Lost City. So, yeah, no Judge. Double Eerie, though, three boss, one Turo. Um, even playing three double Turbo as opposed to four. It's a very interesting Arc Tina 60. It did get second place in the tournament, so there is something to this deck. Losing a Lost Box in the finals, I imagine it you know, kind of came down to the Hoopa. Um, then we got a Lugia in top four. Like I said, Lugia, pretty pretty solid deck still. It's not as good as it was going to DYC, and I think Lugia is going to fall off a little bit because I think that people have found out that, yeah, Lugia is a bit of a pile. It's a bit of a bricky mess sometimes, and the future hands matchup seems pretty abysmal, and that's a deck that is going to be going up in play and most likely in Orlando. So I don't expect to see a lot of Lugia in Orlando, but seeing it do well in the online tourney scene isn't a surprise. It's better maybe in best of one. Um, I think one thing that I've noticed a lot of people say about Lugia after EUIC and why it didn't do as well, um, this deck is definitely more of a pile, and it does tend to brick a little bit more. So when you're in a bigger tournament with a lot more rounds, you're going to have a lot more games where you don't do anything. And I think that's kind of the issue with Lugia right now. Um, these massive tournaments that are long, Lugia can sometimes suffer. You'd have to have a really good run with the deck because you're going to get a couple games where you're going to have those classic Lugia bricks. But Lugia, it's still not a terrible deck right now in the format. It's got a good Tina matchup. And then we got a Sablezar deck here in top four. Very interesting list playing the Coridon EX and a Groudon. So you got some extra technology. I've done a video on the Lost Zone Coridon deck. I am a big fan of the idea of Coridon in the Lost Zone engine. And I do like this deck. I mean, Coridon's pretty cool. You got the Groudon in there. You do have a fighting type attacker with Groudon. Groudon can also take a big knockout on a uh, two prizer with that attack, Magma Purge, which can do up to 240 damage. The problem I have a Groudon is you have to burn two Mirage Gates to make it work, but it is really nice to have a fighting Pokemon in the deck. Two energy is all you need to kill an Iron Hand, so it's not as bad. It's a really cool 60, and uh, I'm happy to see Lost Zone Crydon see some success in these online tournaments. Do did get a top four. It's not the standard Sablezard list with the hands and the Mew we've been seeing, but does have that Crydon, which is a nice big nuke, and then the one prize of Groudon is kind of cool too. We got a couple Iron Hands here in the top eight. We see one here. looks like it might be similar 
to what uh, Yuho played to UIC with that technical machine Crisis Punch, which has kind of been found out as like Iron Hand's way to beat Charizard because at the end of the game, if they knock out Maraidon early on, you can force them down to one prize and then Crisis Punch with three Iron Hand or with three crowns in play lets your hands take a big one at KO on a Charizard for uh, a ton of damage because Crisis Punch does work with Iron Crown's ability. And we got another one in top eight. This one's a bit different. does have the Erica. I think actually both versions of the Iron Hands deck actually were the two different builds we saw in top eight of EUIC. So that's kind of funny. Cool stuff, cool stuff. This one has a TM Devo in it actually for the Zard matchup. That's an interesting tech inclusion. We got a Shampao in top eight. I mean, Shampao definitely will continue to probably see some success. This one actually plays a 1-1 Gengar and a fourth rare candy. So the 1-1 Gengar, I would assume, is how you beat Snorlax. Um, I guess Snorlax doesn't really care about Gengar anymore. Gengar was like a thing at first with the start of the format, and then like Snorlax started tech for it, and then people started cutting the Gengars from the Charizard decks. But I guess if Snorlax doesn't res like respect Gengar, which they probably won't unless you're playing his Pidgeot control, um, you're probably going to have a fine time. It's an interesting inclusion. I'm not sure if you can fit it on the bench, but I guess you're only putting a play in Snorlax anyways. So you're still going to have your typical Shempao bench anyways. And we got, of course, an Arc Armorugian Top 8. Happy to see that. This deck is a lot of fun to play. I did a video on this deck also on the main channel. If you want to go watch that, definitely go check it out. Arc Armor Rouge is a pretty strong Arc deck. It's got a lot of attacking options. Um, it's not as, like, linear as Arc Tina because you do have the ability to abuse stuff like the Gouging Fire, the Delphox. The Armor Rouge EX is really, really good. You have Mew in there, Radiant Heat Ran, a lot of attacking options. It's a really cool 60, really cool deck, and I recommend trying it out if you haven't already. We'll see if Arc Armor Rouge can keep up it's success, but it's cool to see you get a top eight in an online tournament. Then we got the Cinnabar Island tournament. Another Arc Pile ended up winning this tournament. We see it was an Arc Tina with a Radiant Charizard. So it's an interesting idea to play Charizard within Arc in general, not just within Arc Tina. Um, Charizard does have the ability to have a one prize attacker, which can sometimes be nice to have in the active spot. And then you can also use it with Choice Belt to like one shot other Giratinas. Is it better than playing Radiant Gardevoir though is the question. Because you're playing Radiant Gardevoir, Giratina can't one hit KO you anyways. They're forced to Star Requiem you to knock you out in one hit. So I don't know if it's better to keep the Charizard for the Tina matchup or it's worse, but the Charizard does have its advantages. I mean, technically it's fine against Tina too because it does give you a way to one hit KO with Tina with a one prizer. The downside of playing the Zard though is you do have to play switches for it, but there is two switch and a Turo in the deck. So you do have three ways to kind of reuse that Radiant Charizard. So it's an interesting idea. The problem, I guess, with the Charizard inclusion is now you have to play a 1-1 one, one Giratina line as opposed to 2-2. Two, two. So if you prize a Giratina, sometimes that can cause you to lose a game. But it does help against Shempao too. One of the issues Arctina faces against Shempao is you can take that big initial knockout with the Arceus Maximum Belt if they kill your Arceus back, you lose, because I don't know if you can build up two attackers in time. Usually you beat Champau if you get two Training Novas off. You can build up two Giratinas with the Maximum Belt Arc on. You, you know, they kill that Arc, and you go Tina Tina for game. It's hard to do that if you go Arc Knockout. They kill your Arc, and then you go Tina. Well, okay, how are you going to take your last two prizes? So the Zard does fix that, because then you can go Arc Belt, Tina into Charizard to KO Shempao. So that could be an ideal strategy. So I don't know. The Charizard is an interesting inclusion, and maybe it does fix that CPAO matchup. Um... We do see the Pidgeot Art or Pidgeot Charizard deck here in second place. Looks like it is the uh, the William build here with the Cleffa, the Roxanne, the Palpad, the one TM Devo, not the two TM Devo like uh, William played in um, top four there at EYC. But it looks pretty similar to William sixty, and that's kind of what I was thinking. It was like, what Charizard build is going to see more success post EYC? William's build or the Tord build? I think there's honestly a good reason to play both builds. Like I could see you know an argument to play both right now. Um, there's another Lugia in top four. I think Lugia is probably just going to continue to do good in online tournaments because I think the deck does better in best of one in online tourneys where there's not as many rounds. So the odds you have these bricky starts, bricky turns isn't going to be as you know common when you're playing less rounds technically. This build does play Prime Catcher though over Master Ball, which isn't bad. I mean, Lugia is definitely a deck that has the flexibility to play these random ace specs. We got a Shampoo in top four once again. Playing the Tomb and the Ditto um, might be similar to Jared Grimes's um, 60. I think it is very close to what Jared Grimes played at UIC with the tomb and the, the boxed order even in the deck to get two items. Um, yeah, there you go. Typical Shempao. It's got three candies, stuff like that. And in top eight, we also had a Goldango deck. I'm always happy to see a Goldango do well. It's actually a Goldango Scizor deck, not playing the Palkia V-Star in the deck, which it seems good. Um, I don't know how good Goldango really is without Palkia because you don't have access to like the aggressive Prime Catcher Cologne plays. You lose another backup attacker, but you do get Scizor. It does improve your Shampoo matchup a lot. I'll say that. Your Shampoo matchup becomes a lot more winnable when you have Scizor in the deck. Um, but yeah, it's a cool, cool list. We've got the Lady in the deck to get for energy out of the deck. 
Um, I do like the idea of maybe playing like a heavier retrieval engine. We do see the two energy retrievals and the four superior, which will go a long way when playing against uh, Eeries and stuff, which is like the one thing that holds Goldengo back right now is just Eerie is kind of an issue. This build also plays a technical machine devolution in the deck for the Zard matchup. So really trying to tech out for the Zard matchup, which you already kind of are favored against due to the ability to kill them. But when they have Max Belt and Radiant Zard, it is nice to maybe have that extra bit of insurance um, back up. I'm going to feature hands in top eight, playing the iron it leaves in the deck with some grass energy. So trying to tech for Charizard in that regards. Um, that's the interesting thing about iron hands is how are they going to tech for Zard? Because it is one of the hardest matchups for the deck. You're either playing the crisis punch. The problem with the crisis punch is if you're playing against a Charizard player who knows what they're doing, they're going to play around the crisis punch. And then it kind of becomes a little bit harder to win with that. But when you have iron leaves, there isn't really a counterplay to the leaves as per se. You can try to vacuum and stuff, but the leaves kind of keeps up the tempo that you want and you don't there's not really a great way to play around it like you can with crisis punch essentially lost tina in top eight i'm surprised to not see as much lost tina so far in this video i mean we've looked at what two online tournaments but i'm expecting a lot more lost tina at orlando we see this build here pretty simplistic build not playing at the bayonet that bradner played just more straightforward build with the prime catcher and, and whatnot within the deck and then finally we got a snorlax in top eight um this one does just have the straightforward package of the snorlax does have the mantine in the deck um, yeah, just straightforward Snorlax. I mean, Snorlax definitely is taking a bit of a hit, I think, with, like, the popularity of, like, potentially Tord's Charizard, Turo, Yell's Cheer. Even if, like, the Tord build isn't popular, even if, like, the William build starts to play Turo and Yell's Cheer, it gets a little awkward for Snorlax control. Um, but I guess Snorlax control is better than Pidgeot control in these, like, best of, best of one tournaments of Swiss. All right, we got the next tournament, the Standard Pumpkin Amy Weekly. The winner was Gardevoir. Gardevoir stonks have been going up quite a bit since EUIC. Gardevoir had multiple good placements in the tournament. Kind of putting it back into the uh, popularity of the meta. I think a lot of people were very disappointed in Gardevoir when it wrote like stuff rotated, but it is proving to still be a decent deck in our format. Getting top eight in this tournament here um, looks like could be similar to what uh, like Piper Lapine played, judging from the list here. Um, there's no Eerie in the deck, so it's not like the Fabian list, but it's a cool cool thing to see and it did win the tournament and of course second place was another sable czar this time it's not playing karaidon it does have entei v in the deck as the v pokemon attack of choice so no iron hands and mew not what we've been seeing in the normal zard list now sable Zard, i think is still in an okay spot right now in after uic i do think that you know the hands matchup might get a little sketchy if you don't have like a great way to deal with it because you can zard the hands but now that hands can amp ko charizard it's a little tough but sable zard is still strong in my opinion charizard is still a worth a while attacker to play because radiant charizard can do so much damage it's really good against a lot of the big two prize decks with like moon coming back in the format it's not bad so we'll have to see if sable zard can keep up its momentum going into orlando and if it sees a couple of good day two placements the ntv is a nice i guess like backup attacker to have within the deck too um, that's kind of cool. There was a, another deck here. We see, okay, it was, <laughs> it was the Pidgeot Charizard with the Regilecki. Okay, I thought it was something else, but it was just, uh, Charizard with the Regilecki, which was the technology that we saw in UIC. Now, this build of Regilecki Charizard does not have, um, the Giacomo, but it does have the Hero's Cape, um, still in the deck, because that's what some of the Shovel Squad members were playing of Charizard. They were playing the Regilecki in the deck with the, the Giacomo in the deck to help against control and stuff. Um, just to control the energy, I guess. But then you got this build with the Hero's Cape and the Regilecki. Still decent. You know, Regilecki can still be annoying for Snorlax to deal with. I guess there's no Penny in the deck. Opting for the Turo instead of the Penny. Interesting inclusion. I guess Turo is better than Penny in other scenarios. Um, does have a Pow Pad in the deck, too. Um, but yeah, the Regilecki can come up. You can even use it to, like, loop the Hero's Cape multiple times in a game. Or, you know, even loop the TM Devo. We got another Pidgeot Charizard here. It looks like, once again, just kind of a straightforward build with... Um, kind of similar to what William played with the Eerie. You got the Cleffa in the deck. Um, the one belt, one Techno Machine Devolution. No double TM Devo, but similar to what we saw at EUIC in the top four there. Another Tina here in top eight. This one does play the Water Energy. So we aren't really seeing any Bradner builds yet of the Tina deck. We'll have to see if those decks are going to see any play this. Um, yeah, we'll have to see these, if the Tina build is with the, 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 the Bayonet is going to see any playing in these other online tourneys we're going to look at. Another Zard here. This one does play Turo, Shiyu, Palpat, and Yell's Cheer. So, honestly, quite a bit of counters to control the Yell's Cheer and the Palpat and the Turo. It's a lot of ways to recover your stuff. And then it does have that Shiyu EX in the deck to try to mill your opponent. can be kind of annoying to deal with for control sometimes. Sometimes it can be your win con. Um, interesting 60, kind of an all-together type of build, playing different engines like the Shiyu, the Turo, the Palpad, the Yelsh, just all in one. It even has an Eerie in the deck still, so 
able to fit a lot of cards. And I think that's where Charizard is going right now, is just playing these random techs. Another Shampoo in top eight, playing a Ditto in the deck and a Boxed Order. No Spirit Tomb, which I think obviously, I think Spirit Tomb is going to start declining in popularity just because of the Cleffa being kind of figured out now in Charizard, which I think Cleffa is like going to be a mainstay in Charizard right now. So we're seeing a lot of these Shampoo or just decks in general cutting the Tomb out because you don't really need it anymore when the Cleffa is already um, just kind of a good answer to the Spirit Tomb. There was one ancient box here in top eight, and uh, this one does look like it's very similar. Might even be the exact same 60 as Gabriel Fernandez's ancient box deck. I think ancient box is in a pretty solid spot right now in the format. It did win in the seniors division at EYC, and it's definitely a deck that I think is underrepresented in the format. It does have potential. Is it better than the Dunspar's Moon deck, though? It's kind of the main question. Uh, but I do like the idea of ancient box in our format right now. It is cool to see that one did squeak in top eight. We'll have to see if there's any more ancient box decks in uh any of these online tourneys so that was kind of cool to see um and then we can move on actually they went five one draw wait did they go into top gun and then drop that it's crazy so i guess there was another ancient box technically that could have bubbled in um this one bit different than uh the other list we looked at does have the silver wing in the deck so i guess they cut the flutter main for a silver wing also went down to two pokestop for an extra like artisan for some extra pokemon to search in the deck interesting all right we got the sunnies weekly and the winning deck was the charizard Giratina deck once again. So I this is an interesting 60. This deck won two online tourneys. Does that mean this Radiant Charizard Giratina deck is any good or is it more still just a pile? Is it worth playing Gardevoir or Radiant Charizard within the deck? I'm not too sure yet, but I do like the idea. And to see this one do uh, take another tournament win is kind of crazy. This one actually plays two Judge in the deck. Uh, I don't think the other one played any Judge, right? I'm pretty sure the other build didn't play the Judge, if I remember correctly. Now I got to go back and look. Yeah, the Cinnabar Island one. Okay, this one had one Judge, one Eerie. And then this build here played two Judges, no Eerie. But it have a Heavy Ball and a Buddy Poffin. I like the idea of Buddy Poffin um, and Arctina. You can get Bidoofs with it, which is kind of cool. Sets you up pretty quickly. But yeah, cool stuff. This Radiant Charizard idea is really interesting. Let me think of the idea of Radiant Charizard and Arctina. We got a Snorlax here in second place. Pretty standard. It probably would have lost to Arctina. It's an unfavored matchup for Snorlax because Giratina V and Arceus V-Star are pretty annoying for Snorlax to deal with. I guess, like, the Radiant Charizard could be, like, a good Pokemon to stall. But when they have, like, Turo and stuff, it gets kind of tough. You know what I mean? And then, of course, we got a Pidgeot control in top four. Ooh. Or it's a bit spicier. It's a Pidgeot Re or Charizard EX control deck. So this is interesting. So it's not... It's a Charizard EX deck. It's, like, a, it's a hybrid of a control deck with Charizard EX. There's a lot to digest with this deck so i don't know what to make of this deck i don't know what to think of it but it is an interesting idea so the idea of char's rdx with like a control package has already been figured out with like the reggie lecky and stuff or just even playing eerie you can classify as a control deck but this one really leaned into the control elements it's got the buffalant in the deck for energy removal it plays a shiyu it's got mawile it's even playing mimikyu and luxray in the deck the luxray is an interesting concept um in charizard because you can thank snipe slow your opponent down it's a very interesting 60. It's playing Eerie, Penny. It's got the Misfortune Sisters in the deck. Defiance Fest. Even playing the Hero's Cape. There's a lot to go, a lot to digest about this deck. I would not know how to pile this deck properly if I played it. Like, this, there's a lot going on in this deck. This definitely seems like a very convoluted 60. It's even playing four Fire Energy. So it's like, the Fire Energy count's kind of small, considering you can do a lot with it. I guess you can go Fire Energy. You can Charizard... Rare Candy Charizard, Fire Energy on a Buffalon attached DT. I guess that works. Um, yeah, I don't know. This is a very wacky deck, but uh, I mean, it did get top eight. I mean, is this a legit thing or is it just kind of a meme? Is it better than the Alessandro uh, control deck from UIC? I don't even know what to tell you. There's Charizard in a control deck kind of can work, I guess, because if your opponent's very much like trying to limit their resources, Charizard EX can be very deadly to deal with because, like, it's got a lot of HP. 330 HP Charizard EX that can blow you up very easily in one hit because, you know, so you're so late in the game. They've already taken so many prize cards. So Charizard can come in and just kind of destroy you, and you have no way to respond to it because you basically were trying to limit yourself to what you were benching because you're playing against a control deck is a very interesting way to kind of counter the opponent as opposed to the Radiant Charizard Penny Loop combo that Pidgeot sometimes does. All right, there's another Charizard Pidgeot with a Gouging Fire. Interesting. There was a Thailand tournament which uh, spoiler alert seven of the top eight was charizard x which is kind of ridiculous and gouging fire was in actually the charizard x deck that won um in that tournament so it makes sense to kind of see the gouging fire you know translate over is it worth playing in charizard though because you're playing gouging fire you do need to play at least like a turo or a switch or something this deck does have the turo because gouging fire is strong but it gets stuck in the active but or you you know use it early on use it later on in the game is kind of the 
the question because Charizard is better in the late game, but it's interesting to see nonetheless. Got that Moon to Dunsparce here in top eight. Really cool deck. Again, Moon to Dunsparce. It's a really fun deck to play, and I'm happy to see this deck have results. I mean, it did debut in the online tournament, so it's only right that it continues to do good in the online tourneys post EUIC. Actually, see it was Xander Perot playing the deck. Interesting. We got a couple other uh, Charizards here. We got another uh, Pidgeot Charizard. Once again, playing like the William William list. And then uh, we got another Pidgey Zard here. Playing once again, just, uh, yeah, more more streamlined list here. No Clef on this build. Um, no TM Devo either. Just kind of more straightforward stuff. All right, cool. And then round to the top eight, there's, of course, another Future Hands. Just another straightforward build. Not playing any, like, real big Charizard counters. No uh, Crisis Punch. No Iron Leaves within the deck. Um, just more straightforward stuff. All righty, then. Next up, we got the Late Night 188, which uh, the deck that won was, once again, Moon and the Dunsparce. So this deck making a name for itself in the meta in IRL and in the online tournament scene. So, yeah, pretty probably the whole 60 to what we saw to UIC. I'm not too sure on that. Um, just cool stuff. And then we got Pidgeot Charizard, second place. Tord list, it looks like, without the Yells Cheer in the deck. So the Yells Cheer have been cut. Also cut the Prime Catcher. Actually, there's a few changes. There's two Charmeleons. There's a Maximum Belt over Prime Catcher. There's no Yells Cheer double Turo. Just one Turo within the deck. So a few changes have been made. No Cleffa either. Just kind of a mashup of the William build and the Tord build. Just minus any like Cleffas or Prime Catchers or anything like that. Arc Armourouche got top four again. So this deck definitely starting to pick up steam post EYC. A couple of these have now made top eight post EYC. Cool stuff to see. Yeah, pretty uh, similar stuff we saw with uh, Julian's list there at EYC. And then we got another Lugia in top eight. I'm not surprised to see this. Like I said earlier, Lugia can just easily get top eight. It's kind of straightforward list here of Lugia. There's another Charizard here in top eight. This one was Bibzard. So I do think Bibzard is weaker than Pidgeyzard. You just don't have as much control over the game, but this deck still does have some technology. It does play double Turo and Yells here. So still kind of leaning into what Tord played. There's no Cleffa though. I mean, you don't really need Cleffa when you can play like a heavier kind of Bibberol. Again, the issue with Bibzard, though, is you're just unable to find... You're not able to use Pidgeot, which is just a stronger card in most uh, scenarios. But Bibberol is a little bit more safer. And you can also keep your board to just one two-prizer in play with all one-prizers. And that can be pretty annoying for decks to handle, nonetheless. Even if your power level is a bit weaker, because you use Pidgeot. Another move to Dunsparce in top eight. Nice stuff. Pretty similar to what we saw win the tourney. Another Sablezard here playing the Coridon. Whoa, there's a lot of attackers. We got Slitherwing in the deck, which is a Pokemon that you can hit for weakness against Iron Hands, and one Prizer, and I guess it hits Arc for weakness. And there's the Coridon and the Delphox. So two top eights with this Coridon EX and Sablezard. I'd love to see it. I'm a big fan of this deck. I, I don't know. Hopefully my video has an influence on these decks, because I, I just like the idea of it. It's really cool. Coridon and Lost Box make sense, and I'm happy to see it do well. This one has Delphox. Delphox and Lost Box, kind of an underexplored idea that I think can work under the right circumstances. Definitely more in a closed deckless tourney. It can be a lot better, though, obviously. But uh, it's cool stuff to see. And then finally, another Ancient Box here. Made top eight. Um, it's got two research, no penny, um, but only one fighting, too, actually. So getting a little greedy on the fighting energy there. But, yeah, two research, just keep digging, discarding cards. And sometimes research can help a lot to, like, get your hand down nice and low. And finally, we got the last the free entry deck out Monday tourney. And the deck that won it was the Iron Hands with the Erica's Invitation, which is the technology we saw did get into top eight at EUIC. And the Erica could definitely be a little bit of a cheesy card you can sneak out wins with. And that one did it go 8 0. No surprise it beat Lugia in the finals. Lugia, once again, making its appearance in top eight. Doing pretty good in the online tourneys, but in IRL, it's kind of, kind of flippy, kind of flimsy. Another. Future Box Iron Hands in top four, or Future Hands, whatever, not really a Future Box deck. Playing the Erica once again, two Ericas uh, in these uh, top four decks. Interesting. So there you go, two two Erica uh, Iron Hands in the top four. Another uh, shrimp, another Shampoo. Not playing Iron Hands. That is have, it does have Kyogre and Double Cologne. So trying to capitalize more on the Snipe potential. Also has the Arctabax in the deck to play around the TM Devos and stuff. And Eeries, so that's smart. Yeah, I think Arctabax is going to start seeing more play within Shempow now, just to counter stuff like Eeries and TM Devos. Um, we got another Tina here. Not the Bradner build, not playing the Bayonet, just more of a vanilla build of Tina, it looks like, with the double rock sands and stuff. Um, there you go. So yeah, no Bayonet Tinas yet since UIC. We got another Amun to Dunsparce in top eight. Cool stuff. You know, fun deck to play. Definitely a deck that I think a lot of people are going to have on the radar for Orlando. And I actually wouldn't be surprised to see this deck, like, 
make the day one graphic out of Orlando, which we'll talk about more in my meta predictions video later on. And we got another uh, Pidgey Zard, obviously, with the Reggie Lecky. So still trying to play the control package. Does have the Hero's Cape in the deck, too. No uh, Giacomo, but does have the Eerie there. Um, but yeah, cool stuff. Reggie Lecky Charizard. I, the question is, is the Reggie Lecky Charizard idea better post-EYC, or is it better just for EYC specifically? Because now that other builds of Charizard have found more potential, like the William build and the Tord build, is the Reggie build still worth playing? Because the deck still did decent at UIC. Like, I'm pretty sure one of these were, like, was on the winning end to top eight. So it's not like the deck, like, bombed. They did really good day one. Still almost got into top eight day two. Does that affect how the deck's going to perform? Will people still play the Reggie Lecky? And then finally, it's another Arc Armor Rouge here in top eight. Arc Armor Rouge having some pretty good results here post EYC. you love to see it. So that's three top eights for the Arc Armor Rouge deck. Pretty cool stuff. This one has a Gen Energy. And there you go. Those are some of the big online tournaments post EUIC. Things to take note of. Moon to Dunsparce continuing its upward momentum. Charizard still doing really good dominating the meta as we expected. Future Hands also doing good. Lugia doing pretty good in the online tourneys. And that's mainly because of just it's better in these best of one type of tournaments as opposed to like best of three long days where you're going to brick a lot more. Guardy winning a tournament. Some interesting arc piles doing good and some very interesting Charizard lists with control and stuff. So very cool stuff. And some Lost Zone Karide on action. That makes me happy. Some ancient box. A good mix of stuff. And there you have it, folks. That is some of the online turn results heading into e uh, Orlando this weekend. Almost at EYC. Orlando this weekend. And once again, I will be in attendance at Orlando. I can't wait to play in Orlando. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun and I'm pretty excited to play in the tournament again biggest regional of all time so definitely excited for that and hopefully these online tournament results help you kind of figure out where the meta game is headed uh what where people where where people's mind are at right now going in to orlando this weekend post uic because again we only have about a week in between the the two tournaments so not a whole lot of time to really figure out what the play and the plan is and i think the online tournament scene can give us some more ideas of what that could look like but i hope you all enjoyed the video catch y'all later i'll leave a link to play at limitless if you want to play any of these online tournaments yourself and bye-bye